the risk is real. So you want to have trust. Like every server on the internet is prone to be hacked. I expect every single day to wake up and see news that the Chernobyl of smart cities has happened somewhere in the world. Smart cities gather large amounts of data, our data. The advantage? Urban planners can make more efficient decisions based on that data. Resources such as water and energy are used more sustainably. Mobility is improved, cities become safer. Although it's supposed to improve our quality of life, big data comes with a lot of problems. Who makes sure our data is secure? And can we do something ourselves? Cybersecurity plays a big role in smart cities. While a hacker could only do so much damage with one citizen's smartphone or computer, it's a whole other story if data from millions of people was hacked, possibly even at the same time. Anthony Townsend, an American expert on future cities and information technology, has an idea of how severe the consequences could be. I expect every single day to wake up and see news that the Chernobyl of smart cities has happened somewhere in the world. We are primed for that to happen. It is it's inevitable and it's imminent. Although it probably wouldn't look as disastrous as Chernobyl in 1986, Anthony Townsend says that a technological disaster is likely to happen in the upcoming years. What he means by this is substantial physical harm related to the failure of a smart city infrastructure system. I think the best way to understand it is um, think about what happened with the, the Boeing 737 MAX. We have built a system that's layered on top of an older system and not really um, understood what it is that we're, we're building. Uh, and we haven't been able to test it in all the failure scenarios because we're flying it at the same time that we're building it and testing it. Anthony also considers a lack of understanding and oversight a big part of the problem. The companies that have been building it, like Boeing, have been more or less regulating themselves. And so I think, um, you know, we're, we're finding out what the failure modes are by, by running it. Uh, unfortunately, like Boeing, we're running it with passengers inside of it. Um, and unfortunately, instead of having 200 passengers, we have two, 2 million or 20 million passengers. Okay, comparing the crashes of two airplanes with smart cities and the use of my data really scares me. This sure sounds like a worst case scenario, but is it even that far fetched? If everyone's data was connected as one, and if this data then was to fall into the wrong hands, everyone would be at risk. So, what are companies doing to protect our data? In our last episode, I met up with Tom van Aman and Markus Funstein in Amsterdam. They showed me their Crowd Insights Monitor, an installation to enhance safety in crowded areas. One of the key aspects of the Crowd Insights Monitor is that it is open source. That means it allows citizens to understand, follow and comment on the technology behind the project. I think by open sourcing it, you can show the people at least the goodwill to be as transparent as possible about it. So you want to have trust. The trust is the most important thing that you uh, can have with the city. While Markus and Tom think that transparency should be the standard for companies that are dealing with big data, it of course does not eliminate all the potential risks. Trust is good, control is better. The risk is real. Like every server on the internet is prone to be hacked. We have to take all kinds of measurement in order to avoid being hacked. And one is that, that, that the servers are um, ISO qualified. ISO qualified means that it meets the norms determined by the International Organization of Standardization. More than 20,000 norms cover almost all aspects of technology and manufacturing and include the protection of critical information or data security. The ISO standards include Encrypting and monitoring data, 
installing firewalls, automatic virus scanning, consulting independent experts and, maybe the most important part, constantly updating these practices. That way, the Crowd Insights Monitor tries to stay as resilient as possible. So, of course it's up to companies to be transparent and ensure data safety. But is there something we can do ourselves? A joint project by the Dutch company Waag and the innovation platform Amsterdam Smart City lets citizens actively participate in data collection. Saskia Müller coordinates the project. I think it's important to involve citizens in data collection because uh, in that way you can give them the means to influence their, um, their living space or their working space. Uh, if they don't have that knowledge, uh, they don't know if it's necessary to act. And if it's necessary to act, they don't know what to do. The key word is citizen sensing. People using digital technologies, often low cost and self-built, to collect data that helps them to find out more about issues they care about. In the case of the project Hollandse Luchten, Dutch Air, the technology is the Smart Citizen Kit. It consists of a small computer with sensors. They measure substances in the air that are toxic to humans in high concentrations, such as carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. The technology behind it is kept simple for a reason. Anyone should be able to set it up themselves, says Repke de Vries, one of the project's scientists. He also explains how the kit works. It starts with a ventilator. So what the ventilator does, it sucks the air through this small hole yeah. into a chamber. Yeah. And inside the chamber there is a, a laser, tiny laser mm -hmm. light uh, and a detector. And mm -hmm. you can imagine that if the the beam of the laser is disturbed by even small particles passing, yeah. there's an interruption. Mm -hmm. And these interruptions are counted, yeah. and that tells you... Uh, Level of air pollution. Exactly. So the, that, is the, that is the signal who sends everything to the heart. The heart of the kit is this mini-computer. Every three minutes it sends out the data via an antenna. An online platform collects and visualizes the measurements, showing the individual devices as data points on a world map. That way, the kit helps to determine whether air pollution increases or decreases. Another smart aspect of the kit is that the components are individually replaceable. So if something breaks down, and the most likely candidate for that is the, uh, the sensor actually, you just replace that one uh, component. Mm -hmm. All right. Then uh, let's have a look at one of those, and you're going to show one which is close to here, and we're just going to walk there. We will. We will walk over there. Perfect. The kit costs between 150 and 200 euros. There are currently not even 20 smart kits active in Amsterdam. A few more are used in other regions of the Netherlands. So the project still has a long way to go. Repke tells me that most of the volunteer testers want to make sense of their surroundings. You can't control the environment, uh, so you would like to measure what happens outside your house. So uh, some of the participants have actually very concrete questions or concerns when they, when they are part of the project. For example, is it better to open my window on the front or on the back side of my house if I want to have fresh air? Uh, or what is the best route that I could take to bring my kids to school or to go to work or go for a run? Um, and even though it's quite hard to then actually pinpoint from the data what the exact answer is, it's definitely possible to get a, a better understanding. That's Judith Feenkamp. She organizes the Smart Citizen Lab, which brings citizens, scientists and designers together to work on similar projects like the Hollandse Luchten. Judith tells me that combining those different actors brings a certain continuity to data collection. Once you start collecting data, it actually raises more questions. So you sort of get into this rabbit hole of, well, learning, uh, definitely, but also asking new questions to actually pinpoint what, for example, a source is of a pollution or uh, uh, what leads to a specific peak. Judith is convinced 
Real solutions can only be found by fully including citizens and letting them work together with companies to make their cities future-proof. It's very important to show people what the data is used for, but it's even more imp important to also make them open up the conversation to uh, create space for citizens to take charge of their own data and to create ownership uh, with data and then be part of, uh, of, of the conversation of the governance structure that then can uh, uh, come to solutions uh, for societal challenges. In the future, city governments and companies will likely turn even more to using big data to drive innovation. To ensure that innovation does not have to be achieved at all costs, cities must give their citizens the chance to get involved and actively participate in the innovation process. Smart cities require smart citizens. And so having the parallel track of civic tech and open data, which allows for this non-commercial development model to, to play out, where uh, individuals, community groups, NGOs, distributed networks of collaborators, uh, and, and governments themselves, or groups in government, can create solutions to demonstrate possibilities that may not have any commercial value, but have other kinds of value. That, I think, is, is extremely important. It, it rounds out um, the innovation ecosystem so that the smart city isn't only the things that you know, are, are of interest to commercial entities.